Here's where I was going to do the thermal animation, which we already did. Okay. Now, one thing about the earthquakes that's intriguing, of course, it tells us uh, the, the, the structure of the Earth. And I've already kind of done this, but I think I want to add just a concept here called the shadow zone. I should have done this a little earlier. The shadow zones. You see, because um, you can't, your, your seismograph stations, here's the earthquake right here, let's say at the North Pole for the sake of argument. You create two shadow zones. There's the P shadow zone, which you can't see P earthquakes right here. So even if this earthquake occurs right here, you'll never see it over here. And the S shadow zone is this whole area right here. You can't see it because, of course, the liquid outer core. And so the shadow zones um, is what told us what was at the center of the Earth. Basically, lots of seismograph stations all over the world, and they're detecting earthquakes. So even though earthquakes are kind of, we think of them as bad and dangerous and horrible things, it turns out earthquakes have taught um, um, geologists so much about the internal structure of the Earth. They are very, very important. In fact, they help us also. We can actually create little sort of minor earthquakes, or we can tap the ground, and we can figure out what kind of rocks under the Earth. That's how they find oil. It's really a very an amazing um, study. All right. By the way, the guy who came up with all this stuff was uh, Sir Arthur Holmes. So Sir Arthur Holmes, 1890 to 1965. Oh, 1965. Mr. Bergman was born in 1964. So, boy, we were alive at the same time. Um, he helped bridge the gap between the idea and the theory. There was the idea, but he kind of put all the pieces together. So in 1929 is when he did the, the work on this. So, And it took me forever, by the way, to find this picture. Why? Because Sir Arthur Conan Doyle um, was a famous author who wrote Sherlock Holmes. And so he had Holmes and Arthur at the same time. Oh, man, finding that picture was hard. All right. The last thing I want to talk about is probably the most confusing. It is the alternate convection models, which means what else could be causing besides convection the plates to move. Undoubtedly, they're moving. Remember the GPS data. What else could be causing them to move? All right. Well, there's lots of things here. I, I would print this. There's a drag force, trench suction, slab drag, slab pull, trench suction, slab roll back, drag force, ridge push, drag force. What in the world is going on here? So there are some geologists who think thermal convection is not the answer, or at least not the complete answer. What they think is there might be some other forces playing a role. So when they look at this picture, they think of all these different forces, okay, and they say that's what's causing this. For example, when we look, well, actually, let's look at them one at a time. Well, actually, before we look at them one at a time, let's write at this slide. In this slide, this actually measures, they're measuring, what, FRP? It's the force of the, these are, the math on this is very complex. And are we going to study the math? Oh, you got lucky this time. No. So there's some high-level math that goes into all this. All right. So here, are, just I'm going to do a smattering. There's about, I'll go over five of the different types of forces that could be playing a role that, that actually would be a different way to explain why the plates are moving besides thermal convection. Well, we do know this is hot. And so this is like what they call the ridge push. All right. This is from warm, buoyant mantle. All right. The mantle is warm because it's you know it's hot right, and up wells beneath the ridge crest. A ridge crest is like uh, um, you know the the Mid Atlantic Ridge, which causes the topography induced horizontal pressure. Just as this gets pushed up, it causes this to get pushed. It's, they're not saying it's caused by these thermal convection currents or caused by this. They're saying it's just because this is hot. It then pushes this to the side. They call that the ridge push force. Okay. This next one's called the slab pull. Well, this is, uh, this is what we would call a convection zone, or a subduction zone, right? So it's a subduction zone. Well, if we've got the slab pull, that means because of gravity, that's why I talked about gravity a minute ago, because of gravity, that causes this to pull it down as there's more and more material. It gets heavier and heavier, which drags this whole thing. So they think slab pull is also a measurement. This right here, by the way, is a, a theta, and that measures the angle of subduction. And remember last time we learned about if the angle was shallower, that's what created the Rocky Mountains. So it's considered a boundary force, and from most estimates, it's responsible for some of the largest forces in driving the system. So this is an alternative way, or also, by, by the way, when I say alternative, it could also be, um, it could also be just additional ways that help us to understand what causes these to happen. Basal shear, all right, because you've got this force. A shear is where you have forces opposing each other. Here we have a force this way, and here we have a force this way, and that's shearing it, which is resistive. So this is slowing it down. So um, not all, not all forces cause it to occur, but this should slow it down. So they call it basal shear. Or the trench suction. Now that sounds wild. The trench is sucking. All right. <laughs> so here you get a small little convection current right here. Okay. And that's causing this section to go down. 
okay? And so trench section is thought to result from the small scale convection in the mantle wedge driven by the subducting lithosphere. So we get this right here, and as you recall, this is where we get volcanoes, right? At this spot right here of the world. All right, and then we also have the slab rollback because as this slab, this is this huge slab underneath the continent, it starts to roll back, okay? So that's another one. And here's an interesting graph. We're not going to go into much detail or table. Do not copy this down. But here are the different plates. I think this is just fascinating to look at. Here's the Eurasian plate. And here's the area of the plate, 69 times 10 to the 6 kilometers squared. And there's the continental area. And here's the velocity. And if you look down, this is the ones, they're not all moving. This is the number of millimeters per year. All right, so the Cocos plate and the Pacific plate are the fastest moving plates. And then the Eurasian plate is barely moving at all, all right? And so 0.7, you know, that's like a half a cent. They usually, we say they, they, the plates move at about the rate of your fingernails grow. Well, some are a little faster and some are a little slower. In fact, you know, 7 compared to 86, that's a big difference. 86 still, you know, that's 8 centimeters a year, all right? Um, not, not a whole lot, but 8 centimeters, you know, you know, that's about that far a year. Okay, where well, this one moves a lot less. So that helps all the, they're doing all the math to do all of these things. Okay, hopefully that kind of gets you a clear. I want you to understand that the primary thing that helps us, that causes the plates to move, is this thing called thermal convection. But it's more complex than that because we've got all those other things slab, um, pullback, you've got the trench suction. All those other forces are also playing a role. Or in some sides, this thing, the main role. So it's kind of, a, it's a bit of a controversial deal. So, all right. I will see you in Glasse. Uh, goodbye.